welcome everyone to one of our Centennial Lecture Series, Our Money and the Financing of Racial Injustice. We're going to be get, getting started in just a couple minutes. If you just want to sit tight for a minute before Dean Vadeka gives her remarks, that would be great. We'll talk to you guys soon. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Lynn Vadeka, Dean of the University of Michigan School of Social Work. Welcome to all the members of our audience and to our eminent panelists. I am delighted to announce this social justice uh, lecture series. And today our topic is our money and the financial of racial injustice. One of the key themes for the Michigan Social Work Centennial Celebration is our school's enduring core value and focus on racial and social justice. In this final quarter of our centennial, we're focusing on the work of our very own faculty. Today's lecture and panel was championed by Professor Terry Friedline. Terry is a consummate public scholar who's dedicated to racial and social justice. Terry cares deeply about financial equity and her work is incisive about how, quote, business as usual, financial services, digital or otherwise, widen rather than eliminate racial and financial injustice. It's now my honor to introduce Associate Professor of Social Work, Terry Friedline. Terry will introduce today's panelists and will serve as the moderator during the session. Enjoy the, this probing and uh, lively panel. Thank you. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Dean Vadeka, for those remarks and to the School of Social Work for sponsoring this panel. Um, I'm really excited for this panel and the conversation today. Um, and I'm also excited that this is being hosted in a School of Social Work. Um, many people, um, not exclusively, but, but many people joining us today and maybe listening to the recording afterward are social workers. And our social work professional mission includes actively working to end discrimination, oppression, poverty, and other forms of social injustice. And so, um, uh, you know, I am hopeful that our social work profession kind of develops a praxis around the ways that money and finance are wielded in society um, because our policies and practices around money and finance perpetuate racial injustices. And so today's panelists, Dr. Tamara Knopper, Dr. Destin Jenkins, and Professor Lua Yule have been thinking through these topics around money and finance um, in their own areas of scholarship and expertise. And they're gonna share some of their thinking with us today. Um, and so I'm gonna kind of give some contextualizing remarks um, before I, I introduce them and, and turn the floor over to them. Um, but you might be familiar with words like neoliberalism, financialization, and racial capitalism. Um, these words are becoming more common in popular discourse. Uh, ne neoliberalism is supposed to characterize privatization or like the withdrawal of public commitments to one another in exchange for um, the rise of individual responsibility, really like raising the stakes on individuals. Financialization is supposed to characterize the prominence of finance and the financial industry. Um, and how this industry like reduces a lot of decisions to risk calculations. Um, and that these processes are happening within the context of our US economic system of racial capitalism, um, which is a system that exploits social constructions of desirability and of worthiness, uh, which are really rooted in white supremacy and anti-blackness. And so um, in some cases, I think these words, and because they're familiar to us, um, we can use them as shorthand uh, and that shorthand can conceal the power and the intentional decision-making that, uh, that finance and that underwrite racial injustices. And so when we use these words as catch-alls, um, you know, I, I sometimes am concerned that they disguise the very real like harmful policies and practices that have enabled white people to accumulate a lot of wealth, to hoard power, and, and to do so at the expense of, of black and brown people. Um, and so one of the things that, that I'm excited about today's panelists and their conversations are because there are specific policies and practices um, 
that have to do with neoliberalism and financialization, where we might focus our collective action toward bringing about you know, a little bit more justice and more equity. And so in their work, um, today's panelists have, have demonstrated like, you know, some specifics of where power is concentrated, on how it's being wielded, and they're showing us what I think are possible levers or linchpins for change. Um, so for example, uh, Dr. Tamara Knopper's work on credit scoring demonstrates how proprietary algorithms of shape access to money, um, and that as credit scoring agencies incorporate new forms of, of data into their models, that they also increase the possibilities of surveillance, which disproportionately harms racially marginalized groups, but is concerning for all of us across, across society. Um, the tools that are used to score individuals are also applied to cities. And so this has implications for how cities and how local governments um, invest in their residents or don't invest in their residents. And Dr. Dustin Jenkins' work you know, reveals to us how uh, in his book, The Bonds of Inequality, and in San Francisco in particular, consistently made infrastructural investments in whiteness um, to the advantage of white residents. Um, and so uh, as one example of this, one of the things that he elevates in his book are how um, cities that had protests against racial injustices um, had their credit ratings downgraded as punishment uh, for objecting to and challenging racism. Uh, and that made borrowing and, and financing of projects more expensive. Uh, and so I wanna note a connection of this to Michigan in particular, because one example of a severe consequence of this is the Flint water crisis. Um, one of the precipitating events of the Flint water crisis was in 2014, um, the city entered into a contract with a new water authority, which, which issued bonds to finance the construction of a water pipeline. And so banks underwrote those bonds. And in 2020, Flint residents sued those underwriters for what were decisions that ultimately exposed them you know, to, to toxic water. And so I wanna recommend Louis Seamster's work in this area uh, and, and also to remind us that the Flint water crisis is, is a crisis that is ongoing and that there are still people um, living without access to clean water. Professor Louis Yule's work um, as a legal scholar includes theorizing money and property um, including who gets to define and who's entitled to money and property and by extension, who acquires power. And so her work helps us to consider the stakes and the possibilities about how we pay for and we fund the things that society needs, uh, which are clear issues of racial justice. And so I'm gonna um, go through and give uh, specific introductions to each of our panelists um, and then turn it over to them. So Dr. Tamara Knopper is a sociologist, writer, and editor. She's an associate professor of sociology at Rhode Island College. She's the editor of the book, We Do This Till We Free Us, Abolitionist Organizing and Trans Transforming Justice, which is a book of Maryam Kaba's writings and interviews. Um, she has also written a chapter in Ruha Benjamin's book, Captivating Technology, uh, which is her work in particular in that chapter is called Digital Character in a Scored Society, where she discusses how lenders create a digital character for, for people um, through proprietary credit scoring models. And uh, Tamara has also given a number of public lectures that are online and I wanna highlight for you and, and recommend that you um, engage with them as you're able. So uh, one included Punishing Immigrants, the US Immigration Enforcement and the Prison Industrial Complex, which she gave last week. And also a panel last year um, on a very similar topic, public money and racial injustice, racial justice, both of which um, were with Haymarket Books. And so I recommend listening to her talks and also thinking like across these areas of work about immigration, about policing and abolition and finance, how there are some um, interlapping or, or overlapping themes across those works. Dr. Destin Jenkins is a scholar of racial inequality in America. He's an assistant professor of history at Stanford University and was previously the Neuerbauer family assistant professor of history at the University of Chicago. He has had two books released in 2021 uh, and I recommend that you find both of them uh, and engage with both of them. Um, in fact, as you're listening to this panel, I hope that you're like 
keeping track of reading materials and, and other kind of content to engage with so you can extend your learning um, beyond the panel this afternoon. Um, but if you followed along with public discourse on racial capitalism in the last year, I imagine that you have found Destin's work at some point. And so his co-edited book is Histories of Racial Capitalism, which is published with Columbia University Press. And the book that we'll learn a little bit more about today, The Bonds of Inequality, Debt and the Making of the American City, is published by the University of Chicago Press. He has also had a round table, um, a, a round table, a symposium published of his work on Just Money, which you can find on justmoney.org, um, which is really notable to have organizers and scholars engage and, and think about and extend some of Destin's work as, a, as an indication of its, of its real um, significance uh, to thinking about um, how we think about debt and financing and what that means for, for you know, public life. Professor Lua Yule is a professor of law at Northeastern University Law School and the DeMoran McKinn School of Business. She's also an affiliate with the University of Kansas School of Law. And so I wanna note that um, while our time at the University of Kansas overlapped, our, our paths didn't cross then, but I'm at least very glad to make this introduction of Professor Yule today. Uh, her work connects property theory, heterodox economics, business law, critical pedagogy, and group identity. And, and her works have been published in a number of, of law review journals, law review journals um, including, for example, Corporations, Property, and Personhood in the Denver Law Review. I came to know Professor Yule's work through heter heterodox economics and modern monetary theory. Um, and this is one area one example of her work, um, as, she, as she sometimes describes it as being a praxivist, uh, where she uses theoretical scholarship to inform her engagement in social change. Um, and so, so something that I, that I think is exceptional in learning about Lua's work is that um, as she was a, a professor of law, she also undertook a formal study of heterodox economics to be able to use the tools of that and the language of that discipline to inform you know, her critiques of what mainstream economics kind of gets wrong. And so you might also hear Lua discussing modern monetary theory and related work on podcasts like Real Progressives and Money on the Left, um, or through the documentary Finding the Money, um, where she's challenging us to consider how debates around money and economic policy have been framed um, so that we you know, maybe erroneously believe you know, framing our understandings of what the stakes are, um, which might be in error, and what those possibilities are, uh, including how we pay for the things that society needs. And so I wanna welcome our panelists, thank them very much for being here, and begin by turning over the, over the floor to Dr. Tamara Knopper, who is going to give remarks first. So welcome, Tamara. Hi everybody, thank you so much, um, Terry, for that really uh, a wonderful um, introduction and thank you to the Dean as well. Um, and I wanna thank Emma for, um, and Terry for co-organizing this event. And I'm really excited to be on the panel with um, Lua and Dustin. So, and thank you for everybody who showed up. So I wanna just talk uh, briefly about some things I'm thinking through with my work on credit scoring and specifically alternative data. And so I'm just gonna show some slides I have that will help kind of set up the conversation a little bit of where I'm, I'm going in my work. Um, so let me go ahead and share the screen here. And if we go here, okay. So I wanna just talk about kind of what are some of the language and some of the things I'm thinking about here. So there's a whole bunch of kind of issues that have been documented with credit scoring. And I think that this is something that especially social workers and social work students um, are probably already thinking about, especially because, or at least some are, especially because there's been this growing kind of push for social work students to be trained in kind of a quote unquote financial literacy. 
Um, and there's a whole body of work and a, a whole bunch of people critiquing financial literacy for uh, some of the ways it encourages a kind of a neoliberal perspective or a neoliberal approach to the racial wealth gap. Um, and so I'm someone who's also kind of concerned about some of these ways. Um, I often think about what are the initiatives or what are seen as the solutions to the racial wealth gap. And the racial wealth gap is something that is really a kind of a consistent thread through a lot of my scholarship um, over the years. And so some of the documented problems that have been raised <clears throat> about the credit scoring industry is that it's a for-profit credit scoring industry. It is not public and it's dominated by the three credit reporting agencies. Um, there's also a lack of transparency regarding scores and algorithms. Um, and so there's a lot of ways that these companies don't really reveal exactly how they calculate things um, and sometimes don't reveal it not just to consumers, but also don't reveal it to uh, elected officials. Um, and this is actually something I'm working on increasingly as I'm interested in this lack of regulation and why um, the credit scoring industry has been able to get so much power to not be regulated to the extent that it should be. Um, but also credit scores play an increasingly substantial role in shaping our socioeconomic opportunities and beyond kind of what a lot of times credit scores have often been used for in terms of credit card approvals and small business and mortgage lending. But increasingly credit scores are um, used in things like applications for automobiles or credit reports, apartments or private student loans. There's also this issue of credit reporting errors, and it puts a great deal of burden on consumers to try to fix, often without fair resolution. For example, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, a recent report showed that the majority of complaints they get, like 60% or something, has to do with people's credit scores. And a lot of these concerns about um, errors or things that consumers are trying to get fixed, and that it often doesn't get fixed. And then, as I was saying, there's a relative lack of regulation of the credit scoring industry, particularly regarding transparency, data breaches, and reporting errors. So in response, you know, well, excuse me, let me continue here, is that one of the things that people have talked about is that credit scores often um, disadvantage certain groups, um, those who are seen as credit unscorable and credit invisibles. And this is some of the language they use within kind of um, uh, the kind of push for credit scores and for um, the push for what is known as quote unquote financial inclusion, as well as kind of banking the unbanked. And so credit and scorables have either a quote thin or stale credit file and credit invisibles have no credit history with one of the three nationwide credit reporting agencies. So this combined 45 million represents almost 20% of the adult population with African-Americans and Latinx more likely to be credit unscorable and visible than white people and Asian Americans. This is also uh, connected a lot of times to a gender thing. And this has to do with historically, um, a lot of times women uh, could not get credit and it would have to be through husbands, right? And so there's also a lot of kind of issues around patriarchy and heterosexism and marriage politics connected to some of this history. So in response to kind of, you know, uh, what is known as credit and scorable and credit invisibles, people have been pushing for the inclusion of quote unquote alternative data. And um, it's seen as useful for helping credit and scorables and credit invisibles build a credit profile. So there's this whole idea that, you know, you don't have enough data, we don't have enough data on you, or the data we have on you doesn't really help your profile. And so it's this idea of kind of becoming credit visible, as they call it. And um, what financial inclusion advocates suggest is that becoming quote unquote credit visible will ameliorate some of the racial and class patterns and use of alternative financial services outside the banking system. So those fin alternative financial services might be things like payday loans, which you know um, there's been a lot of issues about trying to regulate them. And sometimes people are paying like 300% interest rates and so forth, right? Um, and so you know there's some very real reasons, and this is something I always wanna to try to recognize, is there, there are some very valid reasons about why um, people are trying to find other ways for people to avoid this type of stuff right here, right? It makes sense to not want to have people getting charged 300% by predatory, you know, um, you know, lenders and so forth. So 
Um, you've also seen this kind of push around um, things like home ownership. And so uh, Vice President Kamala Harris, when she was running for president, one of her initiatives was in trying to address the racial wealth gap through black home ownership. And she was pushing for alternative data. And so what you're seeing is um, the ways that kind of conversations about the racial wealth gap and what every people think is kind of the solution, quote unquote, to um, resolving this gap among uh, racial groups in terms of wealth and assets is they'll, uh, you see where whatever the initiatives are, a lot of times the conversation about credit scoring is part of it. So what is alternative data? This is kind of, you know, difficult to, to kind of parse out sometimes. And the reason being is that Broadly, it's just understood as any data that is not traditional. And so from the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, traditional data is you know, right here. It's data that has to do with the credit reporting, the consumer reporting agencies, right? Um, and one of the things is, the reason why I say it's kind of difficult now to parse out what, what is alternative data is that sometimes alternative data is seen as this type of data, right? Um, and we're gonna talk about that in a moment. But it's also seen as kind of, you know, how does the score get calculated? And so this is where kind of the for-profit credit scoring and consumer kind of reporting agencies factor in. A lot of people now, not a lot of people, but a lot of companies, um, whether it is kind of these traditional consumer credit reporting agencies or like FICO is the FICO score, which is kind of dominant in the industry, or um, if it's these kind of fintech, financial technology, you know, uh, sector, um, a lot of them now are kind of marketing that they take into account alternative data. And so you see this like with the FICO score and you see, you know, the kind of dominant players in the industry all kind of, you know, saying we calculate alternative data. And one of the things that's happening is people are saying, you know, we want to be able to kind of have more quote unquote positive kind of economic histories and kind of um, risk assessment factors. And so things like, do you pay your bills on time? You know, um, and so that means some are kind of saying we should have your utility bills, our rental payments, and things like your cell phone bill, right? Or your cable bill um, uh, for those of us who still have cable, which, you know, I, I still did up until a month ago when I finally made the big switch to streaming and I feel so proud of myself. Okay, anyways, and nothing, no shade to cable. Um, so the thing is, you know, as... Um, this is where they're saying we can kind of have different risk assessment factors because we can look at kind of your behavior in a range of activity and not just what has historically been traditional activity, right? And some of the stuff around traditional activity a lot of times required like good credit scores just to be able to get some of those things, right? Um, so what are some of the potential risk of alternative data that people have raised? And this has been raised um, sometimes by elected officials, um, uh, for example, Representative Ayanna Presley and others right now are doing a lot of work um, trying to address the credit scoring industry. This has been raised by think tanks like Demos, um, as well as consumer uh, credit uh, organizations and uh, consumer, excuse me, consumer uh, rights advocacy groups. And so some of the potential risk of alternative data is it could create more or bigger problems. So for example, um, if we think about utility companies, you might get penalized um, or you might have to you know, get charged a fee, let's say, um, if you're late payments. But a lot of utility companies might not immediately shut something off. Um, but you know, a late payment could affect your data record, your credit uh, profile. And so this is something where you know, what might be a delinquent account that can affect you with the utility company, but not affect you in maybe such a drastic way that you have some kind of wiggle room, right? To try to kind of deal with your payment, that could get flagged negatively, right? So it means it opens up kind of um, you know, um, what data you're getting judged on, right? It also raises questions about being able to dispute questionable charges. Um, and then this is something I always kind of want to hammer home a bit is that just being able to pay our bills in a timely manner, right? Um, you know, when we think about people just having to kind of make decisions about uh, what bills they're going to pay right away, what bill, what not paying, you know, um, what will be the least or worst penalties involved in not paying something. We make a lot of decisions about kind of what to pay, when to pay, and kind of what we think the stakes are, right? 
Well, you know, a lot of those decisions are also very much connected to kind of existing wealth disparities and wealth is mainly inherited. It's not earned in our individual lifetimes, um, as well as, you know, our employment and wages and the racial politics of the labor market. Um, human capital is important to earn, obviously, in terms of our credentials and our education, formal education, but the returns on that human capital are very racially, um, you know, unequal. Now, one of the things I want to think about, and I've been thinking about more, um, and this is connected to some of my work on surveillance and policing, is the issue of privacy, right? Now, I, you know, I'm not talking about like just bougie privacy here, where it's like, you know, oh, I, you know, and all that stuff. I'm thinking about what does it mean that more and more your activity is kind of um, collected on you in the name of so-called trying to help you but how might it actually kind of disadvantage you, right? And also build on existing disadvantages and unequal status you already have. Um, and so, you know, this is a, a point that uh, Chi Chi Wu, who is the National Consumer Law Center, she's, a, um, she's, uh, she's um, from there, and she's uh, done a lot of testimony for hearings and so forth that the House Financial Services Committee has done on kind of the issues with the credit scoring industry. And so this comes from a recent um, hearing from the summer, and she says, feeding more data to the credit bureaus is not the solution. Feeding them more data only increases the OLA, yeah, ah, I can't pronounce that word, like, I'm, I'm, I'm bad at this word, so I'm just gonna underline it. I apologize, I should know that word, but I'm bad at pronouncing it and I don't even wanna try. So more data only increases this, power of these three companies, giving them even more power over our information, our financial lives. So this is true, just kind of alternative data and data collection does have kind of this universal effect of just kind of um, increasing the power of these institutions and increasing the power of these companies to kind of decide what they're going to judge us on and what might uh, work against us in our kind of credit profile. But this is something that I want us to think about the racial politics of privacy. And this is something that um, I've often found uh, consumer kind of advocacy and kind of conversation about credit scoring have not always kind of been as in tune with as I would appreciate. And so this is something that the work on race and the history of racism, but also uh, in particular, the work on policing and racism, I think is really, really useful. So who gets to have privacy in the society is often a race, gender, and class issue. I teach sociology of the family, for example, and we look at you know, um, a lot of stuff regarding kind of household economies and things like you know, the social welfare state and public assistance. And one of the things I often point out to my students is, you know, poor and working class people just often do not get afforded as much privacy in terms of being able to kind of just have their basic needs met. And people with a lot of times existing wealth and institutional resources just get to have more privacy to deal with their relationships, their kind of fuck ups, pardon me, you know, whatever we think a fuck up is, pardon my language, right? Um, whatever they're kind of struggling with, whatever kind of, you know, negative activity they might do, they often just get afforded a lot more privacy, right? Um, and I'm not saying that we should hide everything negative, right? I think there's a lot of things that we as a society need to kind of work together to address in terms of harms and so forth. But who gets to have privacy just to have their basic needs met and who doesn't, right? And so I'm also thinking specifically about um, anti-Blackness and how this has structured issues around surveillance and policing. This is something that, you know, obviously everybody is being datafied in some way. So becoming kind of a credit profile or having a credit profile speaks to a level of datification that is, you know, across race. But when I think about kind of what have been the mechanisms or the idea of kind of determining risk and how risk gets associated with kind of, you know, a certain profile, right? The history of kind of how value has been ascribed or risk has been ascribed um, is often rooted in a history of anti-Blackness as kind of shaping the boundary of a profile of what gets used for kind of determining these things. So again, I'm not saying that Black people are the only ones who experience a lack of privacy, but I would say that kind of the mechanisms for monitoring kind of people and groups and determining kind of value and risk is very much steeped in a history of anti-Blackness. 
And so I'm thinking about these are two terms, and I recently got invited to um, submit a statement to the House Financial Services Committee on a hearing um, about consumer financial protections um, that was had recently. So I don't know if I'll end up in the congressional, uh, the federal registry or whatever in the congressional record, but we'll see. But from my statement I wrote, I talked about what is I describe as compulsory visibility, right? It's imposed upon you to participate in existing systems. Um, this is something, you know, and, and also say, this is connected to what I've been thinking about in terms of visibility penalty. How does becoming more visible within existing discriminatory logics and systems increase the vulnerability to being penalized or victims of structural disadvantage. Now, today you have some people um, such as uh, Louise Seamster, a fellow sociologist that uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Professor Friedlein mentioned. Um, and uh, so Seamster and Raphael Tron Chenier, as well as uh, the historian Kianga Yamada Taylor, they both talked about this idea of predatory inclusion in terms of thinking about things like loans and how did once Black people got more access to loans, um, how did they get more access to loans under predatory terms? So compared to redlining, which was a lot of times systematic exclusion, what are forms of predatory inclusion? My thinking on the racial politics of privacy is related to what uh, those scholars are saying about predatory inclusion, but I also think I'm thinking through something a bit different, meaning, if your data is just being collected by these companies or if these politicians say, we're just gonna include this data, it means you weren't kind of agreeing to that participation of that data being included. It just starts to get included in a lot of ways unless you find some way to exist in the society without having any um, kind of economic activity that has to do with rent or utility payment, right? And so um, there's something about kind of compulsory visibility where you're kind of forced to become increasingly more and more visible and your everyday activities increasingly become more and more visible. And that scene is the only way that you can kind of get access to something, right? But also the lack of regulation around the credit scoring industry and the fact that increasingly just to be able to kind of do other activities, um, including being able to accrue some of this alternative data in terms of your payment histories with these other companies requires you a lot of times to just kind of participate in the system, right? And so I'm thinking about, um, even though predatory inclusion and my concepts are, are in the same kind of conversation, I'm thinking about compuls compulsory kind of aspects of it, I think a little bit differently. And I just wanna end by talking about, um, these are some of the works that I would recommend um, once I figure out how to kind of get out of the screen, <laughs> okay? Um, but these are some of the works I would recommend that have influenced my thinking. Um, this is a book by Dr. Uh, Simone Brown called Dark Matters on the Surveillance of Blackness. This is a book, um, and again, you know, uh, full disclosure, I edited this book um, as uh, uh, Professor Friedlein mentioned. Miriam Kaba has a chapter in this book from a talk she gave where she raises this question about kind of privacy and surveillance and are people dealing with the history of anti-Blackness in that. This is um, the book Warfare in the American Homeland, Policing in Prison and a Penal Democracy, edited by Dr. Joy James. And in it, um, uh, this is, um, in it, Dr. Jared Sexton has um, a section, a chapter in it, and he talks about the afterlife of slavery. And he says, you know, um, uh, the afterlife of slavery recognizes no legitimate assertions of Black self-possession, privacy, or autonomy. A permanent state of theft, seizure, and abduction orders the affairs of the captive community its progeny. Structural vulnerability to appropriation, perpetual and voluntary openness, including all the wanton uses of the body so finely detailed by scholars like Sadia Hartman, Horst, and Spillers, should be understood as the paradigmatic conditions of Black existence in the Americas, the defining characteristics of New World anti-Blackness, right? And so here, you know, and I'm not somebody who's opposed to data being collected for useful reasons. For example, I think we should have data collection for public health purposes to help to save us more from premature death, right? Um, but I agree with Dr. Sexton here where he's talking about the history of policing in the post-emancipation period 
and how did other forms of social control, right, through kind of a lack of privacy, also play out in terms of kind of regimes of the buildup of the contemporary kind of carceral state. Um, and then one last person I would say that I would like to see more attention to, um, and many of you, uh, especially in social work, might already be familiar with, um, this is a, a groundbreaking essay by Johnny Tillman. And Johnny Tillman was um, a Black woman who was a welfare recipient, and she was very critical of how anti-Blackness and also um, anti-poor kind of ideologies both in kind of the mainstream feminist movement, but also how um, certain class politics and gender politics also shape sometimes the Black civil rights movement, the Black freedom movement. And she wrote about um, you know, welfare being a woman's issue. One of the things that really led her to actually start organizing against um, how people on public assistance were treated was in her housing project, um, a lot of um, welfare kind of officers would come to the door at like midnight and bang on the door saying, is there another man there, right? And so she was, you know, this is stuff where she's talking about issues around privacy and regulation. And what does it mean to have your basic needs met? You are denied all these aspects of kind of privacy that other people with more resources, sometimes they don't have to worry about as much being used against them, right? Um, okay, so I'll end there. Thank you very much. I'm going to mute my camera and video here. Okay, great. Um, hi, everyone. Um, I want to begin with just giving my thanks to Terry and Emma for the invitation to my fellow panelists and uh, really welcoming the opportunity to talk to many of the social workers in the room. I, I don't often get that opportunity. And so uh, I'd like to, if, if there's one takeaway from, from my talk or my my opening remarks is to think about the bond market, the municipal bond market. If you think about the social services that flow from the financing of infrastructure, and if you think about, say, having clients uh, missing work or needing to, to travel to social, uh, to, to welfare facilities or the department, local department of welfare, and the infrastructure is poor, uh, and that delays their ability to get to a place on time, well, that's a matter of financing. And, and more, more to the point, it's it's squarely in the realm of the municipal bond market. So um, if that's one takeaway, it's, it's that to think about the municipal bond market as a powerful generator of inequality. So um, uh, Emma and, and Terry introduced me and Terry had mentioned my book, The Bonds of Inequality, Debt and the Making of the American City and kind of thought about it in relation to contemporary discussions around neoliberalism and financialization. And, just kind of want to clarify just a little bit. Uh, for me, mine is not a story of neoliberalism. It's not quite a story of financialization. Instead, it identifies liberalism and New Deal banking reform in particular as the culprit. My work demonstrates the limits of providing infrastructure and social services through financial markets, through the allocation of social needs uh, via, via credit. Um, and so it's the New Deal that to me is the crucial starting point. And I'm not alone in this. I mean, many folks have thought about New Deal housing policies, for instance, to, to historicize the contemporary racial wealth gap. Likewise, I focus in on the Banking Act of 1933 and New Deal banking reform more generally uh, as the legislative basis uh, for rekindling the dependence of cities on the financial sector. Um, and so in some sense, it's financialization has something to do with the story and the ways in which in the 1970s is going to limit the political imagination to move away from, for instance, an expansion of federal funding, expansion of federal power in helping cities uh, deal with, with their borrowing costs or with their fiscal, fiscal issues, and instead primarily thinking about those issues in terms of finance as only being resolved through finance. Um, but again, financialization is not why cities are dependent on financial markets. So uh, that, that forces us to think a little bit about our reliance on terms like neoliberalism and financialization. In my, my story, it's, it's not the culprit, although it certainly plays a part in development and dynamics since the 1970s. So I guess um, I want to say a little bit about how I approach the problem of racial inequality. Um, so, and, and just to kind of give you all a sense of, of how it's different from uh, studies of housing, mass incarceration, and changes in work, for instance. So, we could think about the usual ways in which, or the realms of uh, scholars focus 
um, when they talk about racial inequality, housing is one, uh, focusing on the mortgage instrument. And, and as you just heard with Tamara, thinking about the history of redlining, uh, which neighborhoods were safe for FHA guaranteed investments, uh, FHA guaranteed mortgages, and the history after, after redlining, to borrow a title from my colleague Rebecca Martial, uh, in the predatory terms uh, of, of inclusion, to, to again go back to Kianga. Uh, people also think about racial inequality in terms of mass incarceration, obviously thinking about the draconian limits on personal freedom um, and the, the ways in which folks released from prison terms uh, are scarred in some cases by felony convictions, which deplete their earnings over time. Um, and other folks think about changes in work, right? Thinking about deindustrialization or the expansion of the public sector through, say, affirmative action policies and cuts to the public sector um, as ways of, of deepening racial inequality over time. Um, and for me, I you know, build off of many of these approaches, but again, I, I go back to the municipal bond market. Uh, and, and for folks who don't know or don't often think about the bond market, it's the primary way and certainly the most important way in which states in their political subdivisions, cities, authorities, you name it, uh, generate the funds needed to finance large scale capital improvement projects over time, um, distributing the costs over say 10 to 15, 15 years. And in return, they promise investors from whom they borrow tax exempt interest income. So really we're thinking about in this current context and uh, after the passage of the infrastructure bill just last week, um, I want you all to think about it's not infrastructure is not just flowing from so called federal funds, but deeply in tandem with the private bond market and indeed many financiers are already licking their chops at the ability to support uh, the financing for um, this uh, to provide funding for for this uh, infrastructure package. Um, and so for me, I see uh, inequality in three or I approach it in, in kind of three distinct but overlapping ways. Uh, that is more precisely a focus on racial wealth inequalities and those inscribed in the built environment. And just as an example, um, two, two examples I use, I, I can go back to in the book is the idea of the infrastructural investment in whiteness, uh, the kind of mid-century idea, uh, ideological, no doubt, that you can achieve economic growth by satisfying the consumption needs of a white middle class. You can avoid urban declension by keeping white middle class folks from leaving the city to move to the suburbs. And if they live to the suburbs, you can accommodate their needs by building out the consumer playground, finance through the bond market. Um, and so that's one way we start to think about the investment, the infrastructural investment in your Levittowns or other suburban enclaves, but also uh, in, in American cities as well. We can think about racial inequalities reinforced in some cases through ballot initiatives, what's been described as ballot democracy. When you and I go to the, the uh, ballot box in, say, June or maybe it's November to vote on a local bond issue, uh, there's, there has been historically, and I talk about this in the book, uh, in effect, the denial of Black communities of, of investment, effectively rendering them unworthy of debt by rejecting various bond issues. And it's not strictly because of racism, though racism plays a powerful, is an important and powerful force, along with uh, the general context in the late 60s, for instance, of property tax revolts and, and so on. Um, and, and there's a paradox here, because even if you, even when you pass a racially just ballot measure or local bond measure, it's still underwritten by financial institutions. And so the ways in which you can kind of uh, undo inequities in the built environment or at the local level can also deepen wealth inequality and, and deepen power relations and the overall dependence of cities on finance, right? Um, and also approaching inequality through, through wealth um, because again, it, it kicks back income, tax exempt interest income up to investors. And so we're thinking about regressive revenues, for instance, through sales taxes that flow upwards to bondholders. So um, in that sense, that's the racial wealth and then of course the inequities uh, in the local environment, which projects are prioritized, who benefits from debt finance infrastructure, which neighborhoods are destroyed and display, communities displaced in order to, 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 to finance a new vision of, of local commerce and growth. So. It's a little bit about um, what the what the book is about, um, and it's it, towards the end, and, and increasingly, I think a great deal about social movements. 
social movements today and against these financial arrangements. Um, so what I describe in the book is black bond politics could consist of at least two sort of tactics. One is without political appointments, black folks in San Francisco in particular would, would reject a set of bond issues. In effect, the kind of patron clientelist politics that without jobs, local black folks would torpedo a, a bond measure that was deemed essential to local growth and, and political stability. Um, so that's making demands on the state, rejecting the spending priorities, uh, even if uh, only temporarily before political appointments. And then the kind of second tactic is, is trying to organize at the level of the bond market, if you will, trying to motivate um, bond financiers, sellers of financial information to stop financing segregated infrastructure in the South post Brown v. Board. So those are two examples of how black folks in particular start to start uh, try to think about social movement tactics. Um, the boycott was common to both uh, expressions of black bond politics. And I, I just kind of want to leave you all with um, the, the, a few questions. I mean, um, Terry highlighted the lawsuits against bond underwriters in Flint, Michigan today. And I guess one question is we've seen the formation of a mass base, a mass politics around debt for forgiveness relative to say student debt or consumer debt. Uh, but one question I'm increasingly grappling with is how to build a mass base around municipal indebtedness. What does that look like? Um, how do you scale up local practices, local tactics um, to allow for again, cities to not be punished by financial institutions? I can say more about that in the Q and A, but I think I'll, I'll stop for now. I just jump in? I'm gonna do it anyways. Uh, okay, so I'm Lua Yule. And you know what's giving me life right now, sort of scholarly life, is a project I'm working on with a scholar from uh, University of Toledo, her name is Shelly Cavalieri, for the uh, Journal of Law and Political Economies, Racial Capitalism Special Issue. And it's called The White Androcentric Disposition of Capitalist Property. And in this project, uh, and and it's, it's, it's giving me life because it's like a real reflection of praxivism. We are going out in the world and then we're coming together in dialogue and reflecting on the world to think about how the world is and can be changed, right? Um, but in the project, we're like, hey, look, we think property, we're, we're, we're putting on our property scholar hats. She and I both do a lot of things, but we're putting on our property scholar hats. And we're like, we think property is the core object, property and institution, um, not property as stuff, but property like the institution of private property. We think it's the core object of the econ economy, right? Like economics, when you think about it today, you got property at the center. That's how we grease the wheels. That's what we're talking about. That's what we're moving around, right? And we think that that institution, right? So property at the center of the economy, that institution, is white and it's male. Um, and what do we mean when we say the property, the institution of, 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 of private property as we live it, uh, the dominant hegemonic institution of private property as we live it um, in Western capitalist uh, societies at least, um, you know, we mean stuff like Natsu Saito who reflects that, you know, land, a central object of property, like a central um, iteration of property. Land becomes property. This is sort of like legal history. Land actually only became property in a, the American legal system when white people lived on it. Like a core central and still dominant law of our land is a case called Johnson versus McIntosh. And in that case, literally the Supreme Court of the United States and I'm gonna guess a lot of people are no friend of the Supreme Court of the United States here, uh, but they, it's never been a friend of ours because in that case, the Supreme Court said, right? Land is only property if white people live on it. If indigenous people live on the land, it's a resource, it might be a place where they are, but it's not this special thing called property. And the specialness of property is really power, right? Another amazing feminist, uh, race crit legal scholar Cheryl Harris took it further. And she was like, actually, 
when stuff is really important, particularly whiteness, we turn it into property, right? So race and gender wind up being the credentials that decide whether you're an object of property, right? Like the institution of, enslave, uh, of slavery as well, or whether you're the subject of property. You're the person who wields power, but like race and gender are also the signals that indicate whether a resource is worth enough, is valuable enough in this thing called the economy uh, that we should give it property protection. And property protection, when we call something property, right? Money, we call it property. And the reason we call it property is to give it a heightened level of protection. It's constitutionally protected. The Fifth Amendment of the United States says that you can't be denied property without due process of law. And what that means functionally as a legal matter is that the government in lots and lots of circumstances, in lots and lots of circumstances, if they want to take something from you, that we call property, they've got to pay you for it. They've got to go through lots of hurdles. Now they can do it, as it turns out, but it's got this heightened protection. We think it's super special. So that's what I was going to talk to you about. Um, but I don't want to talk to you about that because just a couple days ago, what is it, November 9th? Uh, so maybe Friday, I don't know, maybe Thursday, uh, I, I opened up the Financial Times, don't judge me. Um, and Hugo Cox had a, a, a piece in the Financial Times called How the Super Rich Buy Their Homes. Um, and I realized this story was a core part of the conversation that we're trying to have today. Because it turns out, I didn't even know this. And like, this is what I do. This is what I think about. This is like right at the intersection of where I live. And I didn't have this information because it turns out I'm not the super rich. Uh, the super rich buy their homes with zero deposit interest, or they buy their homes with zero deposit interest only loans, right? And they're not zero deposit entry, uh, interest only loans on like nothing. Uh, they're on $7 million, 400 million pound homes across the world, right? I give no money down. And all I have to do is pay the interest on the loan. Now, if it's a $400 million home, we can imagine that the interest is going to be pretty uh, hefty. But what you essentially get there is all of the relative ease, and I'm saying this intentionally and carefully, the relative ease of being a renter, right? You've got a relative a, a relatively easy access to property, to space, to the power, with all the benefits of the power of ownership, right? You get, you, you, you get low entry and suddenly you get the power of property. And that is exactly, right? In the most, right? They're saying the quiet part aloud. In the most clear way, we see debt, and finance being used to generate, reproduce, and produce all kinds of stratification. Um, racial stratification is huge here, right? We see this happening. This is sort of redlining 8.0, right? And now I sit here from you. So I was, I was, I was, I was all up in a thing. I was all up in a thing when I when I saw this, and I said, okay, I'm going to talk about that. Because I sat there and I was like, oh my goodness, wouldn't it be an, a wonderful way to reduce the kinds of problems that you social workers see, right? Your, your clients have housing barriers because, right? We said the relative ease, the relative, e the, the relative ease of getting into housing, right? They can't even rent because they've got all of these hurdles. But imagine, a system where with the same deposits, with the same deposits that you have to maybe get into a house, to rent it, if you became an owner. And now you have power because you can have conversations in the government because you are the quote unquote tax base. Right? Imagine, so I got all excited. And then I looked at myself and I'm sitting in a totally messy office um, I'm, I've, I've strategically hidden it a bit. 
Um, I'm sitting in a totally messy office in a house that I re recently purchased. Um, and I remember, because I thought about myself, that debt and financial justice in our existing system won't save us. Because in this house that I have, I pay higher interest rates and we know that, right? I, I, I know that it's a fact for me, <laughs> but I also know that just by virtue of my race and gender, that was likely to happen. But it gets more than that, right? Because what do we think? Oh, I get to have my house. I get this level of protection. And all the stuff that we're scared about, those privacy questions that we're asking, that we're mad about, because people in order to get into spaces have their privacy taken away, right? All of these places and ways that finance and access to cash and access to money is supposed to protect us. And the house allows us to do that. And then I'm behind my closed doors. I'm, I'm looking this direction because there's a window, right? I'm behind my closed doors. And suddenly I'm a, lot of, I'm a lot safer. That doesn't actually exist for me in my house, right? I could talk to you in the sort of most triggering way we can think about with Breonna Taylor. But it doesn't, we know that that doesn't happen every day. But I can tell you on the day that I bought my house and I moved in, it wasn't the day that I bought my house because I remodeled it and then I moved in, right? And I'm telling you these little pieces of things that I did because my house is sort of fancy in a fancy neighborhood. And I spent a lot of money to have this special space of privacy and power. But on the day that I moved in, the police were called because how could I be here? And how could I live here? And, and so this is the thing that I wanna talk about. We need to really think about how we leverage, or I, I wanna leave you with. We need to think about how we leverage our existing system, how we leverage our existing system and the tools of our existing system and how we break down barriers to, of interest to our existing system. But racial injustice is technological. Racism is technological. And what do I mean by that? Think of your Apple phone. Think of your Android phone, right? You have it for a couple days, a couple months, a year, and then it is out of date because Apple has come up with something new or the Android phone is something new and you need the new thing. Well, racism works the same way. Misogyny and the patriarchy work the same way. So every day we hack the code, every day we figure out how to get those that we serve, those communities that we're working with access, new barriers are created, right? So getting more cash and cash equivalents, me getting a house, me getting access to debt isn't going to save us, isn't going to save us. And so while we're thinking about how we ensure that people have basic necessities, how we ensure that people are in the conversations of power, we need to have our eyes looking beyond to where and how this system of racial injustice which reproduces itself is going to evolve as we hack it. Um, and, and that sort of brings me a lot of excitement because as we see folks who are hacking the system, we also can be um, raising that battle cry all the time uh, that the system is going to respond. It's like the matrix, right? They're always, always changing. Um, and that's what I wanna leave you with. Thanks all. And we're going to move now into conversation and, and to um, a question and answer period. Um, but I wonder if Lua's question, if that's a if that's a good thread to pick up. So um, how do we leverage the existing system, knowing that it's evolving while we hack it and new forms of, um, of racism and misogyny, you know, evolve with it um, while people are moving um, to, to, to um, do some of the hacks that um, maybe Destin and Tamara have mentioned. I mean, Destin spoke to um, like two ways that um, the Black people in particular, um, you know, rejected bond issues or, um, you know, worked to organize at the level of the bond market. So, um, so that's the, maybe the first question I'll pose is how do we leverage and, and evolve kind of simultaneously?
I'll just go ahead and say I don't have an, I don't actually have an answer to that. So I'll just get my response out of the way <laughs> to make room for others who might. But I, I have to say I just really enjoyed the um, presentations. I really, really did. But I don't have. That's a difficult one, I think, with the credit scoring kind of conversation because it ends up just kind of feeding into the whole kind of process of alternative data, actually. So, um. yeah, I'll. I guess I'll respond. Um, I'll respond with something of a dilemma that I've been thinking a lot about. Um, and the dilemma is this: I mean, so the question is, is how do you leverage? If existing institutions, uh, for me, I'm just going to focus in on financial markets in particular. Um, and it's unclear if we, we agree on that project of leveraging financial markets or if we are imagining existing financial markets or if we're imagining creating um, entire ways of mobilizing investment savings and channeling, again, funds from one source to, to some other set of projects. I mean, but to the extent that we agree on the idea of leveraging existing financial markets, I mean, the dilemma for me now is really one of um, the existential threat of, uh, of climate change and ecological destruction. I mean, just to use the United States context, um, it would be a misnomer to describe the legislative process as gridlock. It's actually obstructionism. Um, and that's to put it mildly. And so given the difficulty of actually getting something like a rather um, banal infrastructure package off the ground, to say nothing of actually disseminating and distributing the funds and the challenges that's going to come with that, to say nothing of the inequities at the local level, state and local level, which would st steer those funds towards racially unjust projects, given the immense challenge there, that doesn't bode well uh, when we consider the, the continued uh, threat and exacerbating, accelerating threat of climate change and ecological destruction. And so to me, the dilemma is uh, considering that, we can also think about the pace with which finance operates, the speed and ability to underwrite deliver funds, deposit, even if it's in a kind of fictional sort of thing, um, you know, keystrokes, I take that point, uh, but the speed with which finance operates um, perhaps serves us better in providing critical protections, infrastructural protections to the most marginalized communities, especially compared, again, to the gridlock process of generating funds through this existing uh, an existing system of say federal grants or even low interest loans directly to municipalities. So the dilemma is this, do we accept the trade-off of uh, an accelerated pace of, of resource mobilization, even if it means deepening the power of finance over our lives? And so, yes, there's the question of leverage, but there's also always, um, this is a tactical one, it's, a, you know, it's about organizing is, what are the trade-offs? Um, who gets to decide that? What is the table, metaphorically, so to speak, uh, that we sit at to debate and decide these things? And the interesting thing is that discussion is already happening. I mean, I've gotten a chance to talk to people about my work who are in the financial sector, and they are already trying to, through ESG investing, for instance, the environmental, social, and governance investing, trying to, to pursue some kind of racially just uh, more equitable environmental sustaining uh, sustainable financing right now. So it, the dilemma that I'm highlighting is born from um, awareness of those existing moves. And so there's the question of leverage and there's also the dilemmas. And again, to just take the problem of climate change um, really I think um, highlights the, 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 the question before us. Well, and I think, uh, uh, Step, step one, right, is to, for me at least, is to keep harping that these things that we're talking about might not save us, right? It might, like, I, I want to be fair, it might save an individual. Some of this stuff might save an individual, right? Figuring out, figuring out some of these problems might make your individual plight better but structurally they're not gonna save us. And to me, that really can be a really great catalyst, at, at least in my own work, 
that has been a catalyst for people who have the least um, luxury for critical social engagement because their time is dedicated to survival um, to, to be activated and to demand space at the con in the places where these conversations are being had or to create their own spaces to have the conversations so that folks who are in decision-making spaces have to start to listen. Um, and so much time is spent. And I, I think that this resonates a lot with like, right, social workers, with lawyers. So much time is spent creating a promise that if, you know, here, let me show you how to budget. Let me show you how to fill out this application for an FHA loan. And that will solve your problems. Um, and then when it doesn't solve your problems, that is individually and structurally sapping of the kind of generative energy that really comes from the people who live this because they are most marginalized, that they live this second to second rather than, you know, on a regular, me personally, on a regular basis, I observe these things in my life, but like it's not a daily, minutely occurrence for me, if that makes sense. I actually, you know, I actually do now have something to say because I was just thinking about, I, I appreciate what um, Lua and Dustin were saying and that helped kind of ignite some thoughts here. You know, uh, when Dustin was talking about, Dustin, when you were talking about how you were working with, like you um, have presented some of your work to different companies and they're already kind of thinking about like a, a different model of doing business or whatever. It made me think about in terms of like climate and all that stuff, right? It made me think about like years ago, I actually used to, I, I kind of, you know, sometimes I don't know if I just put it out of my head, but I was actually an international business consultant for years, <laughs> working with the Fox School of Business at Temple University and with the Small Business Development Center. So you want to talk about neoliberalism. And so the thing is like, um, and so we worked with like these international companies or companies that wanted to go international. I had to write like 50 page reports and entrance strategies and so forth in the global market. And there is the whole like 3P model, like people, planet, profit. And it was all these companies that were kind of like, oh, we're gonna think on these different levels and have a different model of business. And so we've seen kind of some of those companies kind of exist, but I think like, you know, for me, and this goes to what you're asking Dustin about like kind of financialization and do, does some of this stuff kind of stave off financialization? And one of the reasons why I'm really interested in kind of the credit score industry is because for me, like regardless of kind of how, what these debates are in credit scoring, like you could change credit scoring to be a public credit registry. You could change it to be, you know, um, what or keep it what it is now or include alternative data. So all these kind of different things, but none of those things actually kind of address like the financialization and just the power of financial institutions and of kind of, you know, a debt society, right? In terms of like how people just even get kind of some of these things that, you know, Lua was talking about in terms of like the way, you know, um, housing and so forth, right? And, and being able to buy things. And so that's something that I'm really interested in is like, how are sometimes even all these alternatives also a way for us to like, on a on certain scale address real concerns people have about people being left out or people, you know, what is the impact on climate and so forth, but does it really challenge kind of the overall structure of financialization and just the power of like banks and the financial services industry in terms of like not only just how, you know, socioeconomic activity happens, but the logic of socioeconomic activity, right? And that, you know, and so forth. So I'll just say that. To, if there are other things that um, spark your responses uh, to jump in and say those. Um, otherwise, maybe I'll pose one more question and then there are a few questions in the chat and, um, and, and we'll turn to those in a minute. Um, but that question is, um, you know, one kind of alternative, one, one possible way forward is um, you know, like public investment. Um, you know, public credit scoring, um, public property, land trusts, um, public utilities, and, 
And so um, I wonder what you think, you know, about the, about the tensions and the paradoxes there, um, given that, you know, across different aspects of your work, um, we've seen that uh, like calls for public um, have also, you know, advanced, you know, racially segregated, um, uh, you know, property investments, um, a public that has advantaged, um, you know, white people and, you know, how housing is subsidized, um, how, how schools are subsidized and public education, for example. Um, and so around kind of like renewed conversations of, of public money, um, of public banking, of, of those, you know, public investments, um, how do you how do you think of those tensions and paradoxes in terms of like what they can realistically deliver and um, and what we then need to perhaps pay attention to as that public evolves and and might not be the the racially just kind of approach that that folks have been hoping for at the outset. Does that question make sense? I don't know if I have a good answer to it though. Um, but I will say this, I, I think public money is leaps and bounds better than taxpayer money. Um, but I think public money is fraught and dangerous and not the intellectual term that I want or the political term that I want for precisely the reasons that you said, right? So I told you that I think property is white and male. I have other work where I say that the corporation is a white male institution and public means white man. Right, public means white man. That's like just like we, we say working class. We mean white people. So the right, we all know this. The reason there's no public pools <laughs> is that when public stopped being white, then we had no public pools, mm -hmm. right? And we made it a, a a fault of people of color that they couldn't swim, right? The reason we don't have public restrooms anymore is that when people of color were supposed to be able to use those restrooms, then it stopped being a service that we wanted to provide. Right? The reason we don't have real public transportation became when we no longer could build our communities explicitly, our states, thank you, Oregon, explicitly to say no people of color, right? So I find that public doesn't get us very far. And the, the, the step one is to, to start thinking of, um, to start thinking of more and more of our basic necessities um, I don't even necessarily think in rights-based terms, but as the core function of government. Um, mm -hmm. And so it's not about fighting for some small pie called rights. It's definitely not about privileges um, because we know that privileges aren't extended to anybody, but it's the purpose of government. And mm -hmm. so the purpose of government is here to provide things to people. And that, you know, and, and maybe even people is wrong because we know that some people can't capture people of color or immigrants or whoever in people. Um, because again, this is technological and people keep getting excluded, uh, but even public, right? And the Supreme Court, again, I'm the lawyer in the space, so I'm gonna harp on the terrible Supreme Court. The Supreme Court has, has, has right, like definitionally from Dred Scott decided that some people aren't people and weren't, weren't intended to be people, right? Even before that, right? Constitution did it as well. But, but uh, so I think that that is dangerous. Uh, at the same time, the project of the idea of moving from taxpayer as if only certain um, producers get to have the benefit of government works is important. Um, but also the idea of, 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 of the public uh, at, because it obscures all of the categories of people who are never being considered when we call them uh, publics. Besides the fact, right, that then we have this fake notion of private, right? As if there is an actual private sphere when in order to have a private sphere, you have to have the government, mm -hmm. the public to actually sanction the existence of the private sphere. Mm -hmm. I just wanna ask a, a follow-up question if I can. I mean, cause I get, I get the point about the discourse of the public. I get the fact that, you know, the question is who counts as the public, the ways in which access to the public is differentiated. Um, I, I understand all of that. I mean, but I guess also still the question is, right, like the project behind reclaiming the public 
sometimes described as remunicipalism or deprivatization is trying to essentially dislodge the delivery and management of services, vital services from the private sector. I mean, even if we want to say that even the private, of course, is shaped by public policy, I get all of that, but is not is the project itself of reclamation of decommodification something that you think, Lua in particular, is one worth striving for and two has to occur uh, or be pursued outside of the legal realm, the various forms of courts that um, protect certain kinds of publics, provide certain kinds of accommodation. I mean, because you gave the case of the example of Dred Scott plus E.B. Ferguson, but it's not an uninterrupted role of the federal of the US Supreme Court effectively stamping the public in that way. I mean, that's Brown v. Board as even we can highlight the limitations, but it's not, it's not an uninterrupted story. And so I guess I'm just curious about one, the project of decommodification of services, facilities that we um, subsume under the banner of the public and the relationship of the courts to that project. Because I again, the discourse, I'm, I'm with you on that, but I'm but the, it's, it's the other stuff that I'm, I'm really also wrestling with. So, you know what? I think that it's a wrestle, right? Because I'm a lawyer. And so by, by training, I am in some ways an institutionalist. And so I, I think I live in this dialectical space where, where I'm like, I, I want to work with what's there, right? We can't, I, I think it was a great example, right? It's not, I, wouldn't, I, I probably wouldn't say it's not uninterrupted, it's just not a, a linear and, and constant. And even things like Brown v. Board were co-opted, but they were, they, were, they were limited at that same time. But I'm not the person who says that the law can't save us because I actually think that it's not just courts. It's not right, like I am a, I'm a corporate lawyer, right? So courts have nothing to do with what I did. And I also don't just think about law as in law in the books or law from, um, case law, right? We have social law, and I think that it has the power of law, and it works that way. And so I actually think we need to have these conversations in parallel, right? We need people inside institutions, experts in these institutions. I love Paulo Freire, right? We need to be experts in what exists to make what exists better, and we need the people doing the work outside. And so I think we get progress through that dialectical relationship. And, and, and um, Brown versus Board of Education is like a perfect example because you had outside and inside working at the same time and we had some progress and then we redefined the boundaries and then of course racism you know evolved technologically and so we need this constant outside and inside but I really appreciate right again naming claiming and blaming the fact that this process is a constant dialectical process justice is not an end game it's a process. And so we need the agitator, we need the worker, we need the thinker to be in constant, to, to be in constant progress. So I, I would say this is, you know, Dustin, I thought that was a really good provocation. I think both of you, um, I really appreciate what you said, uh, Lua, about just kind of like, we know a lot of times that, um, the lack of investment and the kind of taking out of resources, but also just the hostility towards public is very much connected to anti-Blackness. And when these spaces get opened up, a lot of times legally. Um, and But I also really appreciate what you said, Dustin, about just kind of like, you know, is there kind of a commitment to the project itself, even as we might kind of think critically about the language and how the language might not really kind of encapsulate all the different processes of resistance and kind of, you know, um, the politics of what we're dealing with to even kind of keep that project going, right? So I would say for myself, I believe in that project that, you know, um, of governance. And I believe in the project of kind of the role of the government in shaping um, policies that are attempting to stop premature death, right? I mean, I'm just really big on kind of, you know, um, that type of governance. But I also know that that's something we have to actually fight for is for that type of kind of governance and that approach. But one of the things I was also thinking about is like, you know, so I do a lot of work on kind of 
Asian American communities and I've done and really my foray into thinking about the racial wealth gap was on black Korean conflict and Korean immigrant store ownership in black neighborhoods and that's what I had studied for like 20 some years and did my master's thesis my dissertation on and so forth and and so in the role of banking and globalization banking and small you know federal government resources for businesses and so forth like the SBA and one of the things is that you know what I would say is part of the project of kind of whatever vision we have of kind of having a better public and governance, like I do think that fighting anti-Blackness is part of it. And I think about that in a particular way. And the reason I bring up the stuff about Asian Americans is like, you know, I'm always hearing from Asian Americans in panels I, you know, talk, give, or like um, emails I get or whatever, people saying like, how do we combat anti-Blackness? And their idea of kind of combating anti-Blackness is, and I'm not trying to be shady, but they think it's like calling somebody out on Twitter or kind of dragging somebody or, you know, kind of, and, and a lot of times what I'll say to them is I'm like, you know, there are all these ways that the structure of resources, the structure of distribution of resources, what policies we get um, is very much grounded in kind of resistance to Black people getting good things, right? Or it's very much grounded in kind of, you know, wanting to surveillance Black people and punish Black people to the extent that you'll allow that punishment and surveillance to kind of shape all the system that you're going to live in too, right? And so for me, it's like, it's also about if we're kind of thinking about the public, people think talking about the public is kind of in a universalized way and that we don't deal with kind of race or it's like an identity politic kind of being imposed. But for me, I'm like, no, you actually have to kind of organize and confront anti-Blackness in a very coherent way in terms of, when I say coherent, I mean, meaning you're helping spell out for people how a lot of these fucked up policies and a lot of the like lack of investment in the public is very much grounded in anti-blackness. That's why we have the student debt crisis we do now, partly because Reagan's administration said, you know, college students are parasites. Devin Fergus has talked about this and like, you know, college students are parasites and they're the new quote unquote welfare queen. That's an anti-black rhetoric, but that played a role in the federal government kind of, you know, moving away from, you know, some of the kind of uh, financial support of college students and it helped kind of give financialization more power, right? And so that to me is like some of the work when I say like confronting anti-blackness, it's like, how do we think about how these systems and the lack of respect for the public and governance and policy and these shifts and what we're dealing with has been connected to the use of anti-black ideology to determine what is seen as good policy and not, right? So that's kind of some of the stuff, but I would say, Destin, I'm very committed to kind of the project, even if I also, like Lou was saying, I struggle with like, the discourse on how to kind of get people on board for that project. Um, well, I think there are a number of people in the chat who um, who want to be on board, I guess, is, is what I'm hearing. And so I just want to like reflect some of those comments and note that we have about five minutes left for our panel and, and to make sure that we wrap up on time. Um, I want to highlight um, maybe one or two questions and then um, give you an opportunity to either respond to that question or, or offer a concluding remark. Um, so, uh, so there are folks asking, for example, um, what are kind of like different degrees of less bad options if I can, um, you know, summarize a few questions together. So for example, um, community development financial institutions, um, efforts to help people save and build assets um, and wealth, um, you know, despite some of the tensions that exist. So um, if you are if you are able to speak to like um, the the practical things that um, that what I'm hearing that social workers um, can, can work toward and kind of advise the, the people that they're working with. Um, and to what extent does some of the history like the New Deal era and kind of um, current policy around infrastructure um, you know, how uh, how does the role of finance, you know, also kind of undermine and, and make people vulnerable on those projects? So um, those are two questions that I'll raise um, and and offer you the opportunity to, to respond to those or to share a concluding thought before we wrap up. I'll just say very quickly this, right? Like, I, I think it's useful for social work students if you haven't considered it. I mean, 
there's a lot of really interesting political stuff going on right now around like abolition and what should be the role of social workers, right? And if we're thinking about kind of a strong social welfare state and social workers being part of that in terms of less policing or, you know, and so forth, like, well, what does social work have to do as an industry and as training and as kind of like an approach to things to kind of get away from its carceral roots. I mean, that's part of the history of social work as an industry, right? It was, you know, juvenile courts and all this stuff, right? And so to me, like, I don't know if it's so much like, you know, individually, how do you work with your clients, but maybe how do you work politically to kind of say, what is it that we're being trained to do? Like, what is the work of our work, right? I'm always interested in that, whether it's like the industries I'm in and work in, right? What is the work of our work? And I think that if you haven't thought about it, like that's an ongoing kind of conversation, especially in the in the face of abolition and defund the police, that a lot of social workers and grad schools are doing some really interesting stuff thinking through that stuff on. Well, I was just gonna say one of this this is this is a, you know complimentary. Um, I think that the the engaging directly with this tension that you have between policing and care in social work, right? And so much of the tools, and I, 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 I'm not a social worker, but I've done this with my students, right? We talk about quote unquote professionalism and professionalism norms are, are raced and gendered unjustly. And so I share those things, right? I'll walk people through the unjust system. And I think that that's a really important thing to walk them through while owning the injustice of it so that you can actually become a, a full partner with your clients. Um, even though you might not change the system today in your one-on-one -on -one individual work. Yeah, I just first, thanks to everybody for listening and the really kind words in the, in the comments section, chat section. Um, I, I, I just want to kind of build off of what was just said in terms of social workers as a field, as a profession. Uh, in addition to the work you do as a social worker, you're also, like, like all of us, our consumer of narratives. And so one of the things, I mean, what was said is, is about my work is, you know, thinking about how punishment occurs. And so, of course, punishment of cities occurs through downgrades. Um, but in another way, we're kind of reminded here of hegemony, right? I mean, this older idea from Gramsci, right, about the difference between dominance via force and rule through, to quote uh, scholar Michael Hanchard, the extension of a dominant group's power into political, bureaucratic, and cultural realms of civil society. And so that is to say that punishment also occurs via the extension of a narrative of mismanagement, via the elaboration of a story of excessive demands of minorities and labor unions in cities, through a story that gets picked up and developed by those who are not financiers, which extends the power of finance into political, bureaucratic, and cultural realms. So I, in addition to you thinking about your role as uh, as social workers, you're also consumers of a particular narrative that has been parroted for the last 50 years about why cities are in fiscal distress, the importance of joining all of us and trying to forge what we might describe as a counter hegemonic discourse against that narrative to make sense of why we're in the predicament that we're in. And that necessitates questioning the outside power of finance over our lives, even if it also means wrestling with the dilemma uh, in the face of climate change. Well, I thank you all for being here. Thank you to Lua and Tamara and Destin. Um, gratitude for your words today and for folks who are joining online. Um, and those are, I think, wonderful thoughts to end on for today, um, questioning the narratives that we've been trained on and, um, and what they mean for, um, for perpetuating power and hegemony. Um, uh, through those narratives. And so thank you to everyone. Um, it was good learning from you and uh, best wishes for, for your weeks.